Personally, for me, I felt the second half kind of after that momentum up to the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise kind of to, started to dwindle a bit because it's like, oh, it, I use the analogy, it's like Scarface. It's the build up, the build up, the build up, and boom, here's the montage, you know, where everything's going great. I got to say, I, uh, I'm i very excited to talk about this documentary. Uh, I'm a big horror genre fan. And uh, I mean, I can tell everybody else here is as well, uh, <laughs> both from your backgrounds as well as from your actual filmographies. Uh, yeah. and this one is just another wonderful chapter in uh, shining a light on a legend. Uh, so how did uh, the project really come about to, you know, dive into the career of one of the greats in the genre? I think both Chris and I had been obviously huge fans of Robert. I mean, if you're a horror fan, you're you're a fan of Robert England. There's just no question there. Freddy Krueger was always up there. But obviously, most horror fans, especially fans who were born in the 80s, uh, you know, and 90s, he's always been there. So we'd made some documentaries on some classic horror films like Hellraiser, uh, Fright Night. Uh, we'd worked obviously Pennywise, uh, the story of it, uh, working on Robodoc at the moment in post production, and. Um, we wanted to do a different kind of like doc. You know, most of our docs about celebrating people, a particular film, and very focused on that one film and a story bit around that film, which is great for us, but it's quite kind of limiting at the same time. So we wanted to do one about a career, really. And Chris has always wanted to do like a biography. Uh, so when we discussed it, it was kind of the only person I could think of uh, was Robert, really, because I'm sure Chris will obviously interject in a second, but it was. You know, for, for me, Robert is just, the, you know, the biggest horror icon out there, really. He's up there with, you know, Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing and, and whatnot. So it had to be Robert for me and Chris. And I just can't, I've said this a few times, but I just couldn't believe that a documentary hadn't been made on probably like the last horror great. And I, I really feel compelled to always say this. That's not to put down everyone else, but Robert as a face value horror icon who completely made a role his own and you... You literally put him next to his character. You can easily say him within the same breath as Freddy Krueger. I, I was just <laughs> dumbfounded that no one had done it already. So it was just like, yes, an opening. <laughs> so then what was it like when you actually did approach him with the idea of, you know, hey, we want to chronicle your career, not just the horror genre, but also what you've done outside of it leading up to, you know, your iconic status? I think we've been kind of told beforehand that Robert was quite difficult to get hold of. And, and, you know, you had to go through his obviously management agency and, and obviously, you know, they all protect their clients. Of course they do, you know, a couple of Brits, you know, um, contacting, asking someone to do a documentary without really kind of anything other than that saying, we love your work. doesn't really go down well sometimes. So we had another avenue, which was through Nancy, Robert's wife, because our friend, Mikey Perez, who produced Never Sleep Again, uh, and many of the documentaries, he obviously knew Nancy, and he said, um, you know, here's her email address, send her an email, and, you know, hopefully she will then obviously be that kind of gatekeeper for you. So I wrote Nancy a really long email, and it was kind of, you know, it, it was cheesy and cliche, but it was from the heart, really. It was about my love of Robert, and particularly Robert outside of Freddy Krueger, that I'd followed his career. More of, a, more of a horror genre as opposed to, obviously, you know, what we identified in the doc with, obviously, his drama and comedy. Uh, but I'd always followed him, especially from his work in the 90s to the early 2000s, when he was in a lot of horror films. And um, the next thing you know, she messaged back saying, Robert would like to talk to you at, on Sunday at 8 p.m. Uh, next thing you know, 8 p.m. on Sunday, the phone rings, and it's Robert. And the strangest thing that, with that conversation was it was... Uh, he wasn't even like having even a hello. It was a straight up conversation as though he knew us for a long time. And, you know, and he was, he obviously knew we were genre fans. He did his research on us a little bit, obviously, in regards to the docs. And he was just literally, you know, he was very keen uh, on the doc. Uh, he had some obviously ideas, which again, I'm sure Chris will mention about kind of, he's kind of like, you know, he's concrete kind of thing he wanted to talk about. Uh, but yeah, and that was it. We met him in London. Um, and that was it. So, Chris, you know, in terms of obviously what he wanted out of us, you're probably best placed to, to discuss yeah. that. <laughs> I think the the stipulation was so, as uh, Gary's saying, with our producer Mikey, Nightmare on Elm Street's been done, Friday the Thirteenth's been done, um, but with Robert, the the sort of the prerequisite was if we're going to do something, another doc on Freddy, because I'm sure there's multiple ways you can look at that franchise and different angles and whatnot. Then he would give us an interview. However, if we were to tackle his career as a whole and shine a light on all the films that people may not know about as much, certainly the set ones in the seventies, I think, then he would give us his all, you know, you've got access to everything. So of course you're going to go with the more lucrative approach of like, yes, the photos and everything. So 
And it was a bit of a no-brainer in that respect. It was the thing I was kind of looking forward to in a way the most. There's a lot of reasons why I've enjoyed tackling this. As Gary said, we've focused on one film, which is great. That kind of limits your audience and the sort of the stretch you can get out of, you know, what you dive into. But, um, I mean, for me, I've always been a fan of um, one of his earlier works, Stay Hungry. And it's really not a film you would enjoy as a kid, but somehow I loved it. And it was the selling point for me initially with that was um, Schwarzenegger. I found like a VHS back in the day, like, you know, and I'd never heard of it. And then when I watched it, it's just like some, just, how can you call it? It's not slow, but just like a 70s drama. And there's not much to it. But at the same time, you're watching it going, holy shit, it's the Terminator, Jeff Bridges' star man, or the dude, and bloody uh, Freddy Krueger in one film. Um, so I've always been a fan of that. And so the idea of sort of tackling that aspect of his career, that, you know, it wasn't like he just became a star overnight. He had about a good 14-odd year career prior to yeah. Freddy. Certainly, obviously, we had V. And I think that's just what I was looking forward to, is kind of like tackling different eras of the industry. I love the 80s, but I almost equally love the 70s. So that was one of the sort of selling points for me, was tackling that. And, of course, Nightmare on Elm Street. How do we do something that's already been done to death and in a really good way by that means. Um, but just from a different angle, of course, we're going to have Nightmare on Elm Street. We've got it at the start. We've got a big chunk in the middle. We've got Wes Craven's new nightmare. We've got uh, Freddy versus Jason. We've even got the Goldbergs. So he's unavoidable, but I guess then that helped us kind of build a bit of a narrative because there's not much drama in Robert's life. It's a very sort of, he's had a, you know, thank God, a pretty straightforward life. There's no, you know, it's not like Kane Hodder with his burn accident, uh, you know, his injury for the stunts. So that gave us a bit of an angle for, okay, what's what's the, not the reason for this doc, but what's kind of the hook to it or the, you know, right, what we're trying to chronicle here. And I think it's just the dichotomy of, I'm a working actor. I've done a range of roles and performances. This big thing happens. Is it a curse? Is it a blessing? And I think that's just what gave us something to work on then, like a baseline. So before I ask about chronicling the the outside of his, his journey, uh, I do want to talk about uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street stuff, because I am curious. You you have a clip in there from the remake, but then there's no real discussion with him about the remake. And I'm curious, did you try and, and get that in into the doc at all? Or was that something that you personally felt you wanted to keep out uh, just to keep the focus on him? I think we tried to keep it out, to be honest. I think because it, it would have took the focus away from him. Uh, and obviously, you know, the whole, why didn't you do the remake? And I think the whole point of the doc, it's really hard, this doc is because uh, I read a review the other day. It was a really, really good review. And then he said, oh, but they focus on Norman Elm Street when the whole point of the doc is the man behind the glove. But the, the glove is so important. It's so integral to his career. But I think if we, if we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about him now, Reed, really, and that's obviously the blessing and the curse somewhat of obviously Robert's career. However, I think if we would have gone on to the actual remake, it would have just kind of like gone a different tra tra trajectory. We had the same discussion with Pennywise, to be honest, exactly the same. You know, it, it becomes a different doc then. And, it, you know, it's included as a bit of an in-joke, really. Obviously, I think when Adam Green says, you know, no one can play Freddy or something like that, I can't remember what it was. Uh, can you imagine someone else playing Han Solo? Yeah. Or someone yeah, yeah. else playing Freddy? Yeah, can you imagine someone yeah. else playing Freddy Krueger? Yeah. And, you know, so and that's not take, yeah, it's not taking anything from the remake. You know, it really has some interesting elements to it uh i just think it came at the wrong time and i think you know i think it was done today there would be a very different spin on it i think really so no it was kind of I, I, for me it was conscious decision not to talk about it remakes are a bit of a taboo i think as well across all the documentaries we've done we tackled it a little bit with um fright night slightly just for yeah. you know about two because minutes chris, because chris was, yeah because chris random, random was in yeah the remake uh robocop it was the same uh the problem is and that's not personal opinion completely, but I think especially in the lay, in the lay, the lay of the land, the audiences who watch the originals, love the originals, grew up with the originals, as soon as the remix mentioned, you know exactly where that conversation is going to go. Nine times out of ten anyway, in terms of like a chat forum or something. And it's, it's yeah, it's just a difficult one really to kind of just... If you're going to go there, you don't. I, the main thing for us is we don't want to, sorry to use language, bullshit. You know, I mean, everything's got to be kind of authentic. So we don't want to do a puff piece. We want it to be honest. So if there's not really much to say about the remakes or mm. I'd rather not, I'd rather not say anything kind of thing. Like, yep, fine, cool. We don't, we don't want to kind of, you know, cast the Yeah, if you haven't got anything nice to say, don't say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, that's that's a fair approach uh, because you're right. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street is one of those remakes where the, you hear it and you go, uh, uh, no, yeah, let's yeah. not talk. <laughs> um, but I, I like the way you include it in there. Um, now, in in wanting to avoid this being a puff piece, uh, you mentioned you both have said how Robert has had kind of a straightforward life. But I'm curious, is there any part of his personal life or his career where when you went to discuss it with him for the doc, he was a little hesitant uh, or a little reserved in really diving into it? I think that not goes really, with the interview. Yeah. Doesn't yeah, it? yeah, not really. I think, I think, yeah, I think the interviews of you know, again, because my talk about this in a second. Obviously, our relationship developed with him on each interview. There's four interviews, and you can we we can see you know, four interviews how we've developed our relationship with him. But I just don't think there's anything there. I mean, he touched upon his first wife in in a sense very briefly, really. And I think because he ended kind of you know in a, in a positive way, in a nice way, and I think because. Absolutely. Amicable, yeah. And because Nancy's so important to him now, I think he would avoid probably going too much detail about her because obviously Nancy's this real kind of like big figure in his life. She, you know, she's more than just his wife, really. She's kind of like his confidant, his manager, you know, in in a weird way, you know, she protects him, not his manager, she's his protector. Uh, so, no, I mean, we discussed obviously his mother a little bit, which we didn't really clue too much in the dock read about of his mum when she was ill and she became quite ill. Um Again, it's really hard in a doc and a narrative because you, you get certain beats and suddenly you can get some negative beats where it kind of just takes it, you know, takes it away. And, and once Absolutely. you get into that, you've got to stay to, stay on that flow. You can't just brush over it, and that's the problem. It was just surprising. We kept saying it, me, Chris. Where's the drama? <laughs> what? Yeah. Know, well, what, it's kind of what I would say in the edit, really. So yeah. we've got we had a different ver. Well, I say it wasn't drastically different. But we the version we screened at Sitch's Film Festival last year is not this is not entirely the same as what's now being released. And it was such a cool thing to be able to do that. And I think touching on, like you said, if there's any taboo points or anything that's a little bit like let's address the elephant in the room in regards to, and not just Robert, the horror genre as a whole, is what we didn't have initially was let's be honest, the 90s were a bit, a bit shit for horror icons. For the slasher genre, and that's and again, that's not him. I, I, you know, I love all my chains. Yeah, you know, Chainsaw Massacre franchise died a death. Friday Thirteenth died a death with Jason Goes to Hell, and then, well, ironically, Wes Craven's New Nightmare is one of the best ones, and yet, but it's still tanked. And so, I think that it was a what we didn't have before, which I really wanted to get in there, um, was the fact that the nineties weren't so much of a great time. You know, that's where you saw that, you know, star started to diminish a little bit, the character. So what we were able to do is we screened it at Sitches um, and got a good res- good response. We were happy with it. He was happy. Personally, for me, I felt the second half kind of after that momentum up to the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise kind of to, started to dwindle a bit. Because it's like, oh, it, I use the analogy, it's like Scarface. It's the build up, the build up, the build up. And boom, here's the montage, you know, where everything's going great. Um, whereas originally it kind of then just went film, 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 film. So we sort of, what we incorporated was like a 90s montage of his career about how he was going around the world, even the early 2000s. But what was great was being able to actually just get, build the confidence and relationship with him and then say, do you mind if we talk a little bit about the 90s? And we kind of not manufactured the answers, but I mean, what was great was being able to actually direct him. You know, so the Halloween anecdote to this in this documentary wasn't in there before. And he and I've heard it before, but it was only when I sort of used the analogy because I only had my camera and a phone on me. So I had to, like, put my phone in his pocket and use that as his lav mic and then put my camera on, a, like, a coffee machine. Luckily, like, you know, 4K one or whatever. Um, and as I was doing, I thought, God, this looks so trampy, what I'm doing. <laughs> like, we'll just use that IKEA light there and the... Um, and I, as I was doing that, I explained to him, I was like, oh, this is what I learned from Tommy Lee Wallace, who did Halloween 3 when we did The Fright Night and Pennywise. You know, he always utilizes the scotch tape and chewing gum approach to filmmaking. And I've always, I've really embraced that. I love the idea of just using your things around you. As I said that, that's when Robert goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember working with Tommy on the set of Halloween. Shit. Go, go, go. Talk, 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 talk. So being having that opportunity to kind of come back to something before it goes out to the world um and then incorporate that uh the film with henry fonda he was in and uh and most importantly for me just a bit of a narrative for the 90s you know just let's be honest and he, i think he does to be honest he kind of you know fesses up that he, he ended up doing disney films in the 90s until that kind of resurgence of the early 2000s indie uh craze so 
that's I think the closest thing we got. And I, I'm really glad we were able to incorporate that because it might have been like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then it's just like film, 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 legacy. So that was the important thing for me. Again, a bit of narrative in that uh 90s and 2000s section. Well, I'm glad you were able to find that because it is really a, an interesting chapter to get to explore with him uh that yeah. in that that era. Uh before I let you both go for my final question, I'm curious. Obviously, genre fans, Nightmare on Elm Street is the, one of the big things to talk about with this film, but was there any one other horror film outside of Nightmare that you both were really excited to get to dive into with Robert for this one? I think for me it was 2001 Maniacs. I think cuz Robert, you know, it's one of the films in in the early 2000s where you really saw Robert in the horror. I mean, he'd been in Urban Legend, he'd been in Wishmaster. It was his movie. So he was just, and Tim was brilliant, the director, Tim Sullivan. Uh, he gave us lots of archives. I really enjoyed that one. And having Lynn Shea obviously talking about it as well. I think I'll agree with you. If I had to add another one, it'd be slightly different. Um, yeah, and what Gary said, we got so, that's the thing, when you got film by film by film, Oh, we haven't got much for that one. We haven't got much for that. But 2001 Maniacs felt like its own story, you know, and it was compelling as well because of the issues it had with the unions and whatnot. But I think the one for me was kind of being able to tackle um, Eaten Alive a little bit as well. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, like the whole Buck thing and everything like that, and getting Eli Roth, who's associated with Tarantino and everything like that, you know, so to say, and it's just been um, in Tarantino's new book. He mentions the whole "My name's Buck" thing as well. So it's a bit like we got that, we got that on film. I thought that your favorite one was Fear Clinic uh, in relation to the penis story. Wasn't? <laughs> Come on, don't project yourself onto me now. Gary. No. <laughs> Again. I loved hearing about that story that, that <laughs> when I was watching it. Um, it, made us, it made us all feel better in the room. I think it did at the time. <laughs> oh, it's not just us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, guys, thank you both so much for taking the time to chat. I greatly appreciate it. I had a blast with this documentary, and I think genre fans in particular are going to love it, as well as just those who enjoy the franchise itself. So, uh, thank you both so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your weeks. Thank Thanks you. very Appreciate much, mate. It. Cheers, Graham.